all my my close friends. So first, I would like to welcome Sabina Sabrina Benyudrim, who is co-founder and CEO at Founders Lab and also director at Startup Grand Beijing. We know that her heart lies here in Beijing, but uh, due to COVID-19, she's dialing in all the way from Algeria. So welcome, Sabrina. Nice to have you. Yeah. And also we welcome Mr. Yelta Wingender, who also is a head of community at Inaway, founder and CEO at Founders Lab, Founders Lair, and Epic Community Manager and Director at Startup Grind. And a proud owner of two cats. Welcome, Yelta. Hey guys. Yeah. Awesome. So before we dive in and learn how to navigate navigate uncharted waters of startup ecosystem of Beijing, let me shortly guide you in our agenda of today's event. So first, we will make a short introduction of the main organizers of the event. Then I will give word to Sabrina and Yalta, who will share their deep insights and experience regarding the the topic and around 4.50, maybe now a bit later due to internet problems of Yelta, um, I will jump to Q&A session and finish our event around 5.05. So yeah, let's, um, and yeah, I also would like to encourage you to write your questions in the Q&A session there that Yelta showed you before he zoomed out. Um, your questions will be uh, directed to the to our speakers in, during the Q and A. So um, let's get on with it. First, I would like to introduce the lab. Um, the lab is a um, landing platform for foreign entrepreneurs here in Beijing. We are a um, government-supported program from Zhongwenzhou and Haidian government. Uh, we can support uh, startups who would like to enter uh, Chinese market with uh, with all the important steps in the beginning with getting entrepreneurship visa, green card, or establishing your uh, company, registering, getting your co-working space, or legal consultations. Further on, we can help you to find uh, right partners, uh, apply for, um, for uh, government support, and so on and so on. So everything that you need, we can help you. So if you're interested in landing in China or trying your out, your, uh, trying out your luck in this country, um, please um, don't hesitate to, to text us or find, uh, scan the QR code that should be happening right now. Uh, yeah, the QR code to our LinkedIn. Or you can text me privately in Zoom. We'll be happy to chat. Uh, further, I would like to shortly introduce Startup Grind, which I'm also happily a part of. Um, Startup Grind is the uh, world's largest independent community of uh, entrepreneurs which connects more than three and a half million of entrepreneurs. We are more in more than 125 countries and 600 cities. So the, the major cornerstone of our community are the monthly events that we organize with local founders, innovators, educators, and investors who share their experience that they learned on the way of building of awesome companies. Um, so if you would like to learn more about Startup Grind, you're also very welcome to text me or any one of today's speakers because we are connected deeply with this organization. Now I'll give word to Sabrina, which will introduce the Founders Lair. Thank you, Kaha, for in introducing all the partners for this event. And last but not least, uh, we are also co-organizing with Founders Lair. Um, so as mentioned before, Yelta and I are working with Founders there. It's a free peer-to-peer -peer platform for founders, um, which strives to help founders and entrepreneurs find faster the resources that they need. Um, also, if you would like to know more, we'd be happy to chat about this after the event. Um, and now I will go further uh, into the content of today's event. Um, so uh, firstly, I will introduce the basics of uh, startup ecosystem theory, as we call it. So just a general overview about what are startup ecosystems and, and the main players um, that constitute one. Um, later on, I will give a short also introduction to the macro perspective on the Beijing startup ecosystem. I'm uh, naming a few of the main players and just to give you a bit of background about what Beijing looks like. Uh, about its startup ecosystem with a few names. 
Um, and later on, for the uh, second part, we will go into the uniqueness of the Beijing startup ecosystems with, a few, uh, with sorry, naming a few cases. And later on, um, we will guide you into how to actually step a foot into the ecosystem with highlighting a few mentors as well as community representatives and, of course, uh, startup founders. And as the last part, we'll uh, introduce the no-goes and red flags. And this will be, uh, these last three points will be introduced by Yelta as the market expert for um, the Beijing ecosystem. And we will end, of course, by the Q&A session that was introduced earlier. So again, just making sure, feel free to text in the box below. And we'll make sure to uh, tackle as many questions as we can. Um, so going further, um, if a little background about Beijing's geography. Um, so as you all, I hope, know, uh, Beijing is the uh, capital of uh, People's Republic of China. So it is located in the uh, North uh, China municipality. Um, here you can see it as a small red uh, point on the map. However, uh, land speaking, uh, it is actually about the size of Montenegro. So Beijing could, could actually be its own country. And here going into the different districts that are in Beijing. Um, so the, the two red ones uh, in the middle were the, let's say the initial Beijing inside the city wall, which were uh, Dongchang and Sichang, missing them a lot, but uh, hopefully be back soon. Um, and then, uh, and this is currently in the second ring road. Um, and Beijing is actually uh, structured in terms of ring roads. So you can also see it here that it's actually like kind of little circles. And then outside the second ring road, we have the four blue districts, which are the Haiyan, uh, Chaoyang, Fengtai, and Shijingchan. Um, so uh, yeah, these are bigger ones because they have been established uh, a bit later. And here you can also see numbers of the population and the area. And later on, going further on the outlying districts that are all around, but this is all uh, part of Beijing. Um, and uh, now going into the actual um, startup ecosystem intro. So how to speak about the startup ecosystem without uh, introducing startups. And here we will go into the introduction of the different stages of a startup. Of course, there are, there are graphs that are way more complicated than this one with the um, death valley that maybe some of you might know. We I will introduce it in an easier way that I hope will be uh, easy to understand for everybody. Um, also, the next few slides that you will see, this was uh, made out of research from our founders, their team in the last uh, couple of months. So um, uh, this is according to us. Of course, there are many other uh, ways to introduce it, but this is what we have uh, come, uh, come up with. So I will start with the uh, soon to be uh, stage. Uh, which is pretty much when you have an idea, you are in your room working on it, and you think that this idea will save the planet. Um, however, you do not have a business plan yet, uh, leave alone a financial plan, and of course, uh, it is only the beginning. This cannot be called a startup yet, but the work towards becoming a startup has definitely started. And unfortunately, this stage is usually not mentioned in um, mapping um, websites, platforms, such as, for example, Crunchbase or Startup Genome, uh, because it's not officially a startup yet. So this is what we would call a soon-to-be. Um, later on, we would go to the early stage, and this is um, actually where the... Uh, the strongest and the, the most uh, proactive people from the soon to be stage will end up in. Um, so an early stage startup uh, by definition would already have a registered business. Um, and here it's actually where a lot of resources and a lot of time is put in place. Um, questions like how to make money, how to make this business better, or just how to survive are usually asked in, in this uh, stage. And here there are two ways or actually three ways to continue the journey. Um, so the first one is the little gray sad one, uh, which is the death where AKA the Valley of Death name comes from. So this is where 90% of startups end uh, because pressure is too high because the business plan is not as good as the founding team thought would be. And uh, usually those who end up in the death uh, stage 
either reconverse into being serial entrepreneurs, so we'll open more and more startups, or we'll try to join another startup. So usually the death is for the startup specifically, but there are still ways to, for founders themselves and for entrepreneurs to revive from it. Um, later on goes the business stage. So this is where a startup is technically not a startup anymore. Um, so where the growth is not on a daily basis anymore, there are no, um, there's no risk. Uh, like, I mean, the risk is uh, lower into how to survive. And also um, the, the growth is steady, as I said, the revenue as well. And usually these type of businesses are out there for more than 10 years. Some people would still call that startups, but according to us, it is mainly a business at this stage. Um, later on, uh, the most interesting, I'd say, uh, according to me at least, uh, part is when a startup would go into the growth stage. So this is actually like between the early stage and the growth stage, uh, the most also attractive part for corporates and investors when it comes to startups. So this is when a startup has uh, is above um, A plus round and reaches exponential growth. So this is the lucky 10% who actually end up being uh, to not end up in the death or uh, just disappearing, but actually like grow and make their startup a successful one. And uh, last but not least is when if a founder or like the startup has uh, managed to be sold or also a founder has um, exited uh, successfully. This is what would be called IPO or also in other words, the stock market launch. Um, so that was for the stages of a startup and uh, this graph will remain on the left corner. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but anyways, left corner. Um, to, to keep in mind for the, the um, startup ecosystem uh, donut that we have here. Um, so uh, the rocket in the middle, as you maybe have guessed, is the startup itself. So in order for a startup to strive, it needs an ecosystem. And here are the players that are, again, according to us, uh, vital for a startup smooth journey and just mainly a survival. Um, so the startup ecosystem is constituted by different players and they are investors, um, incubators and accelerators, corporate innovation units, governments, community organizations, service providers, and universities. All of them are equally important and uh, all of them have to actually function correctly in an ecosystem in order for a startup to have, as I mentioned before, the smoothest journey possible. Um, so I will just start by talking um, a little bit about each player. I will not dive into details because uh, that would be just too complicated and this is more of a general introduction to startup ecosystems and later on we will dive, as I said earlier, into the uh, specificities of Beijing. Um, so incubators and accelerators, as you can see, have different subcategories as uh, all the other players. Um, here, they're actually the one of the first entry points for uh, the beginning of the journey of a startup. Uh, this is where these players are actually able to uh, provide uh, founders and startups with uh, services such as mentorship, such as sometimes also places to work uh, at, also alumni programs. Um, so here, uh, to name a few of the subcategories that incubators and accelerators have can be um, maker spaces, can be corporate incubation, can be university incubation, and these would all be mentioned under uh, incubators and accelerators category. Uh, moving on into corporate innovation. So usually uh, bigger companies would have uh, accelerating or incubating programs here named as corporate incubator and uh, corporate accelerator and smaller uh, entities would have units. So uh, for example, yes, a corporate innovation department uh, within a unit in order to actually like strive to move from a very traditional business to working more with startups. And this is where the corporate innovation comes in. Um, later on goes the government. And this is where, um, especially in China, a lot of support comes from. Um, so they are, of course, uh, city initiatives and also countrywide initiatives. Um, other, other things can, in this category, category sorry, that can be named are chambers of commerce or innovation hubs. 
Innovation Hubs are also very popular in China, and uh, Yelta will mention about them earlier as well. Uh, then come community organizations that are also for a startup, uh, for a startup journey. Uh, and here we can see that a community organization also has many subcategories, so it's not only about uh, let's say focusing on just startups in general, they, they are different categories and different community organizations for different uh, focuses. So here to name a few are female empowerment, uh, general community for startups as uh, ASK with SG, um, hackathons or, or nonprofits and so on. Uh, so they're actually important uh, for the soon-to-be because uh, usually community organizations can help more with the development of um, a founder who is not there to be soon uh, to be a startup and community organizations are here to help with actually this stage of uh, becoming a startup and meeting, for example, team members or co-founders and just having uh, more and resources without actually having a business registered. Um, moving forward is the next player with service provider. Um, so these are uh, for a startup in terms of, let's say, logistics, if we, I can call it this way. So in here you will find all the uh, necessary um, players that would help you with, for example, registering the company or a uh, bank account, making sure that you have insurance, um, what else yeah entrepreneurship training so these are uh, actually here to help us have a good structure in place and to make sure that not only on the um, investment side and on the let's say like development side but also i think is a place uh, in terms of logistics and um, last but not least is universities so this is where mainly talents come from um, in capitals, usually universities have entrepreneurship programs in place. And uh, this is where, for example, the university or also uh, incubators come in. They're also student organizations so uh, that are in place that could foster more the development of entrepreneurship to help students to not only follow the traditional paths that are out there with the curriculums but more trying to develop something new and this is where mostly like the, the talent lies so it's also very important uh, it's a layer that is unfortunately sometimes neglected neglected sorry um, in startup ecosystems but it should also have uh, its own importance as this is where uh, let's say the brains and the minds um, are made um, so this is all for the um, introduction as I said it's a into each uh, subcategory and explaining it. So this is just a general overview of the main players that a startup, according to us, um, would need to have a smooth, a smooth journey and to have all the confidence to help uh, the startup to actually be in the 10% successful. Um, and now I will go into Beijing map um, of the players that are uh, in Beijing for each of the categories that I mentioned before. Um, so, uh, just to name a few again, because uh, we have a market expert for that to dive more into this. Um, so, in terms of uh, investors, as we mentioned before, uh, there are uh, different ones as VCs and uh, um, others in place. So, here, for example, I could name GenFund or Plug and Play, who are also investing in startups. Uh, coming into incubators and accelerators, um, for example, uh, 3W Coffee, which is actually uh, not a coffee, but this is, again, um, an incubator. Also, other players that could here are Inaway or uh, Banke. Uh, then going to corporate innovation units, we have uh, Merck that is present in Beijing, um, also Volkswagen or Hitachi. Um, moving on to governments, uh, here are the... Um, government-based, um, government-led, sorry, um, uh, organizations, uh, institutions, uh, probably can call it this way better, um, such as OTEC, Oregon Inouye, or uh, La French Tech, uh, actually helping uh, startups uh, also in Beijing with programs. Um, moving to community organizations, there are quite a few also in Beijing. It's very uh, populated, and now webinars are also popping up from everywhere, from communities, because we all want to keep uh, moving and keep on being active. Uh, to name a few are 
Drive or German innovators or again ladies who tech. Uh, and moving on for service providers, here also a lot of um, players uh, are, you can see, are mentioned in different categories because there is an overlap of the different uh, things that they're doing. So an incubator can also be a service provider, as in uh, here you can see a few such as uh, 3W Coffee or Innoway that I mentioned before all also the uh, team accelerator. So they, they are actually providing more than just the incubator or accelerator, uh, let's say functions, but also service provider. And uh, concluding with universities, so some of the main programs that are mentioned in, Be in Beijing that foster uh, entrepreneurship are the uh, app from Tsinghua and also the Peking University um, Entrepreneurship Program. Um, and now uh, this is uh, again like the main players that we have uh, here you can see in the middle of the circle are the ones that are according to us a bit more active and on the outer skirt of the circle are that are let's say less active but still present in the ecosystem um, so yeah this is these are not all obviously because Beijing is huge this is what we have found and now moving on into more details with the uniqueness of Beijing. And now I would like to give the word to Yelta to introduce to us a bit more into details, Beijing. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Just a short sign from the panelists. Can you raise your hand if you can hear me? Good. So um, there was a slight delay, thanks to my internet. Um, I hope Wu Yang, my colleague who's listening, also maybe uh, works on upgrading our internet afterwards. Um, one thing that we, can you go to the next slide, please? Right. So um, one thing that I want to highlight is every, every startup ecosystem is unique. Um, a Berlin is different from a San Francisco, different from a Paris, different from, uh, from Beijing. Uh, what we are trying to do here today is to show you how you can navigate very easily into the Beijing startup ecosystem without um, facing too many problems. In certain ecosystems which are more evolved um, or have developed in a different way, like San Francisco, it might be that um, for the minimum validation points, which means how many of these players you have to reach out to to get actually a good overview of the ecosystem. Um, it might be that in San Francisco, for example, one player is enough. Um, so you can go to one community organization and you get a very good overview of what's happening in the ecosystem. Um, depending on cultural things, um, on business ethics, on uh, geographics, on uh, size of the city, uh, dynamics can be very different. In Beijing, um, what we have found is that you actually need at least three points uh, to get a very clear overview. One sad thing is most of the startups that come from the outside usually only work with one. And the major in entry point is government. Uh, the governments usually have uh, big programs to bring the startups over and they, they share information about the startup ecosystems, but with their own um, perspective on things and their own expectations, what they want with the startups. To get a real um, overview on what's happening in the startup ecosystem, we need to cross-validate information very often. Um, in Beijing, you need the government definitely. Without the government, moving there is impossible. You will need resources, you will need, um, there are a lot of uh, grants and, um, and um, positive effects that you will get from the startup uh, from the government side the thing that you unfortunately not get is a direct to the market linkage for that you still need the incubators and accelerators there are some who have like developed very strong networks that you can actually dive directly into the corporate innovation sector so if you're looking for clients work only with one good incubator or accelerator because they have developed all the network they can tell you who are the good corporates and who are not you do not want to end up with corporates who have not experience uh, working with startups. Usually the, the incubators and accelerators can help you there. <coughs> and as Sabrina said, the closer you go to the circle, those players usually know what they're doing. Um, it's a bit uh, currently still a, 
uh, subjective um, assessment, um, but later on it will be also a bit, be a bit more market related. The incubators and accelerators can also tell you who are good service providers. Um, like an incubator, um, one of the parts of, of Innoway, for example, is having their own incubator with the lab. Um, and they can introduce you to service providers who can help you to set up your, your entity or with legal problems or um, with anything else that's related to the entrepreneurship journey in China. So you do not have to go to investors yourself. You do not have to go to service providers yourself or corporate innovation. If you go to incubators and accelerators, you have that already ticked. So you're not wasting your time, but you're getting good information. So if you come with the government and you go also to incubators and accelerators, you have already two very good points. The reason why community organizations are mentioned here is because we have realized that there is a lot of truth missing. Most startups come to governments and come to tours visiting Beijing and they are shown around in incubators and accelerators. But they never meet any actual founders. They never meet people who actually live and work here. So they only meet the, um, the program managers of the accelerator. They meet the, the person who's in charge of giving grants and, and, and uh, writing the policies. But the people who are actually doing the entrepreneurship, you're very far away. And there the community organizations actually help because they know who are the startups. And in Beijing, we have uh, developed a couple of very um, strong community organizations that are focusing on cross-border um, startups. Everything that we are doing here today is not for um, it's not specialized on Chinese startups um, because for that uh, there are other players in the market like uh, Sanchi Lioke, uh, 36KR, um, who can show you very much around. So you see uh, 36KR in the service provider area, uh, who can show you very much around uh, what are the specifications of the Chinese ecosystem. But what we are trying to do here is um, to give you an, an easy entry point for cross-border startups or startups that maybe want to emerge here, which have an international background. Because that um, is something where Beijing is still in its um, very early stages and has not developed um, well yet. So if you have the, the time and you want to come to China, make sure you have uh, strong players from all three of these minimum validation points, because then you get a complete picture. You get what the, the government promises you, you got what the real market will say about corporates and investors, and then you can validate it with the truth from the community organizations. Um, so please keep that in mind. If you have questions about this, there are any startups here from, from abroad and you want to know more, please, please let me know. But we go into details of each of those and show mentors and, um, and people who can help you around. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is actually a very simple overview. Um, of, of Beijing. So first of all, it's the cultural hub of China. Of course, all, also the uh, political hub of China. Um, we have a very strong international community, but not as strong as, for example, Shanghai. Shanghai is still, uh, if, you, if you would say like one to 10, and 10 is like super international, Shanghai you can rate on an eight, and Beijing I would rate currently on a, let's say four to five. Um, so it has still a lot of potential to grow. Um, the good thing about, <coughs> about Beijing is there is a lot of culture still here. Um, so if you go in some of the uh, second or third year cities, it's, um, uh, finding Chinese culture is, is hard. You have to go very far uh, to actually get it. But Beijing has still a lot of uh, positive aspects in terms of culture, which is a good thing. Uh, why it's a good thing? Um, you also need to uh, figure out as a startup founder, where do you want to uh, be based in terms of do you like the um, the way of living um, and culture plays a very big role. If you're in a city that is just about business um, and was built within the last 10 years, like Shenzhen, uh, let's say 20 years, um, then you're missing a very big cultural part. But um, people are different and people have different um, uh, 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 wishes and needs in terms of culture, right? <coughs> Industry, um, I think the only one that is super important here is um, uh, the, the area of artificial intelligence, internet services, education, uh, electronics. So you will find all the big uh, companies here uh, that are focusing on AI um, and uh, all the talent actually also comes from, from or most of the top talents in terms of AI come from Beijing. 
uh, sector. So if you're an AI startup from abroad, um, Beijing is very close to, uh, to the challenge. It makes more sense to be here, but it's also more expensive. Um, another very positive thing is um, the headquarters of most Fortune 500 companies are in Beijing. The reason for that is all of them need to have um, government proximity because as a Fortune, international um, uh, Fortune 500, we need, you need to know what kind of policies are coming up that you can react very quickly. Uh, that's one of the reasons. Um, so if you're a B2B startup and you want to come to China, Beijing is definitely a, pl uh, a too well place. It's the same with investors. All of the, or most of the headquarters of investment firms uh, have their seat here in Beijing. Um, but they are, of course, also in other cities in Shanghai and Shenzhen. Um, we have created tons of unicorns, um, 82. I'm not sure if that number is still accurate. I think it's like from the end of 2019. Um, might be that in the last weeks, um, startups died, even unicorns. Um, but still, it's a very impressive number. And um, yeah, uh, so if you want to surround yourself with uh, fast growing and, and um, like amazing companies from China, that's the place to be, Beijing. Um, one very important aspect is education. So having so many universities and um, uh, research centers is a, is a good reason to come here because uh, you will find easily talent, but again, it's a bit more expensive than in other cities. Uh, 60 universities, uh, that's massive. Uh, so I think, I, I don't know the number now for like how many people graduate every, every uh, year from Beijing but it's probably in the hundreds of thousands. So that is a lot of potential um, to hire. Um, one thing that Sabrina shortly dived into is the uh, coffee culture, uh, the coffee incubator culture. Um, so just that you know, uh, Kaha and I, we are currently based um, at Inouye, and Inouye is uh, an entrepreneurship landmark in Haidian, and we have a physical street, and there are a lot of these coffee incubators. Um, the reason for that was in the beginning, uh, the government wanted this place to become uh, like a landmark for entrepreneurship, but they didn't know really how. So they attracted a lot of players which rented the space because there were uh, subsidies and things in place. And uh, what they did then was just say, okay, let's, let's rent out a 24-7, um, like a 24-7 coffee place and see what happens. Um, at one point, people came and they started working there. And uh, were the, the coffee places were approached by um, some of these successful startups um, by coincidence that just happens. And uh, they, will, uh, they were asked like, do you have actually space to rent? And uh, through this demand, then later on, they developed in the second and third uh, floor of their buildings, like co-working spaces, they upgraded their service offerings. This is something that happens in a lot of places of the world actually. But this coffee incubator culture is something very unique to China. And there are a couple of cases like Sun W, Garage Coffee, uh, IC Coffee, and so on and so on. Um, but the market is also tr transitioning. Many of these players that, are, that were very famous um, 10 years ago, they are now struggling because they are stronger players in the market now. Um, just reading a question, are unicorns in Beijing or China different from the global tech hubs? Yes, um, wait, from other global tech hubs. Um, I come to that in a bit, um, so I'll answer that live. Transparency. Um, so here are just three highlight points. One good thing about China is um, the phone finally makes sense while well, you can see it. Everything is on your phone. You don't need a wallet anymore. You can just go out. Everything is like somewhat logical and they're collecting tons of data. And it's actually most of the things are really, really convenient. But the thing is, there is data and there is data. And there is things where it makes sense and things where it doesn't make sense. Um, one example that I want to give is um, in terms of transparency. Many of the government players, uh, if we are like looking at the triangle, uh, the government players, um, they always share data with you, which is not entirely accurate because they want to beautify what they have. So um, in any city in China, what will happen is if you're a foreign entrepreneur and you come here, um, they would say, we have so and so many thousand startups, we have so and so much funding, we have so and so. So they will, uh, usually they start with um, statistics like our place has um, 20,000 square meters and we are like 200 meters long. And uh, these are statistics that seem to be important for Chinese, for internationals, that's usually not. Coming back to transparency, um, most of the times these numbers are not accurate. 
Um, they are accumulated over the years. And if you ask like, how many startups do we actually have, the number is like only a, a fraction of that. So be very, very care careful if, uh, if uh, governments want to um, lure you in with big numbers, especially when they say we have 500 international startups, which happens a lot. Um, just ask around, where are they? Um, let you, they should pinpoint uh, them down. Uh, this is something that you should be aware of. Uh, community versus community. Um, there is, from my understanding, an international understanding of what community actually means, and there is an understanding what community means in the Chinese sense. Um, it's very different. Uh, community in an international sense is a bottom-up development. So you usually have um, people who know each other and you let the people create something. In China, the understanding for community is more shichu. It's like a, it's a certain area that people live together and that's a community. Um, but it's just like the physical um, overlap that, that qualifies them as a community. So if you're trying to come here to China and you're looking for something vibrant, something like where people are getting uh, things done, where they can um, also shape uh, their surrounding, which happens very often in communities. So if you go to a community, sort of community in, in Berlin, you will see that people are creating things. They are shaping their, their spaces. Uh, please go back. Yeah. They are shaping their spaces and, um, and their surrounding. This does not happen very much in China. Um, so please be aware that there is a very uh, different approach to this. Just, um, okay, can't, well, please interrupt me when there is any question that is like relevant for me now, because otherwise I start reading um, too much. Okay, um, then the next one is, uh, let me see, I cannot, I see my face is there, internet. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the reason why I'm late is internet. Um, if you're coming to China the first time, and many people do not want to listen to this, uh, there is an international internet and there's the Chinese internet. And these things are completely different. Uh, you see this if you're in China and you go to LinkedIn, it's a Chinese LinkedIn, it's not an international LinkedIn. Um, this has pros and cons. Mm, I just want you to be aware that um, since there is a different internet, it comes with tons of different dynamics. Uh, marketing is different here. Nobody uses Facebook, YouTube, whatever, Twitter. If you're coming from the US and you try this, you die. Um, and this is something that's unique for China. It's nowhere else in the world. Um, maybe Russia is developing a bit into this, but um, uh, I would say it's a very, a very unique thing for China. Um, please be aware to prepare for this. I will not drop any names here. So please, next slide. Um, this is a very China, a bit Beijing uh, related topic. So we have uh, in, in the US and the rest of the world, you have a Google versus Facebook versus um, um, Apple. Um, and some other companies. These companies are like um, monopolizing data. Uh, without them, uh, only a few things are possible. In China, it's, it's quite similar. So um, until recently, there was the BAT, so Baidu, uh, Baidu um, Alibaba, and Tencent uh, fraction. Those were the biggest and most powerful companies in China. And any startup that grew to any point of importance and developed anything were usually acquired by any of those. Um, because they never wanted to let any company to become a competitor in a way. So you see that uh, all of these companies built this kind of octopus strategy. They are diving into travel tech, into uh, AI, like voice translation, into uh, food tech, whatever. So they are building a lot of these like different business models and they are building these super apps. Um, what happened now with BAT is Baidu is not as important anymore they're like slowly getting out not sure if they are coming back but um yeah they're losing a lot of ground what happened recently is new players came um on board which is totiao meituan and didi um totiao you probably know from tiktok um and in bytance so these players are now competing with the others and it will be very interesting to see how uh, the market actually will will evolve but again why is this important for the startup ecosystem um, startups grow here, they grow to a certain point and they end up usually in one of those. Um, just that you understand the life cycle of Chinese entrepreneurship, um, that's usually the end or the happy ending for most of the startups. Okay. 
Next one. <coughs> I think that answers a bit the question from Barry Chien. Any specific benefits for foreign entrepreneurs to set up? Yeah, and Jung Wan Sun. Um, yeah. Uh, just one thing startup competitions lately. I mean, you all heard there is something called COVID. Uh, it's annoying. So all of the offline activities are down. Um, and so all of the governments, they have these programs to bring in people. I will share uh, one or two examples later on, but uh, that's the only thing they know. Uh, they don't know how to do online um, um, competitions and things like this. So I, I doubt that uh, things will happen anytime soon. So this is a very important thing. Thank you, uh, Wuyang, for sharing the, the map actually with me. She just shared it with me um, this morning. So the role of the government. Um, this dives a bit in the direction of difference of unicorns, um, China and international, and a bit of where startups actually come from. So a lot of the things that you see is, um, is touched or influenced by the government. So you see a lot of uh, things not emerging bottom up, but top down. Um, in Beijing, not so much. So there is still a lot of involvement of the government, but in many other cities, you will see the governments telling uh, the universities, please create an IoT startup because we heard it's hot. And then you have this startup emerging and they are not solving any real market demand. And um, the thing is they, they get pushed very often with a lot of uh, capital. And then you have these E round, C round funded startups, but they have no real market because it's like a top down approach. Um, but that's another story. Let's dive a bit into Beijing. So um, Beijing, one of the specialities is there are Zhongguan Sun science parks. Um, so there are, you see the yellow uh, areas on the map. Uh, they are scattered in entire Beijing and each of these parks stands for a certain um, focus. So it can be biotech, health tech, it can be design and art, um, can be business in general, uh, trade and so on and so on. These um, parks usually have a very preferential um, policies for startups, entre entrepreneurs, innovators, and also talents. Uh, so the, the government wants to guide all of the innovative people to come to these areas. Um, in these uh, Zhongguan Sun parks, there are 40 uh, colleges and universities, also including uh, Tsinghua and Beida, Beihang, a couple of others. So the top universities of China, where all of the top talents come from. So these um, are parks that you should definitely have on your radar. Um, you want to settle down in one of those. You get preferential uh, policies. And um, if you're asked to uh, ask anybody who's in an incubator, just ask them what's, what kind of policies do we get there? Do not go to any area and set up like your, your office in a random WeWork, which is not in any of these parks because uh, you will not have a lot of benefits. Um, that also includes visa policies, for example. Um, so there are also a lot of uh, science labs and uh, uh, resources coming from, from this area. Okay, next one. I see a couple of good questions, but um, I'll dive into them in a bit. I call this one university conglomerates. Um, not sure if that's the right term, but uh, what it actually is, is um, most of the top startups come from actually, or are somewhat related to Tsinghua or Beida. Uh, both of them have entrepreneurship schools. And uh, one thing that you realize is 80% of all the top startups that get anywhere to B round or C round are related to, let's say this Tsinghua uh, conglomerate. You see there are three names, Tostar, uh, Tsinghua Accelerator and Tsinghua XLab. These are actually comp competing against each other. So each of them have their own programs. Each of them want to focus on um, international programs. Um, each of them has their own mentors and batches and so on and so on. Uh, Tustar, uh, uh, Tustar, I would say is one of the strongest ones because they have also a very large investment fund behind them. Um, the others also have the opportunity to work with these investment funds, but I would say there is a bit more distance. Um, what I can say for now is Tsinghua XLab is one of the uh, places where you get a lot of, um, or some of the most foreign entrepreneurs coming in because Tsinghua has a very good university program, uh, international one, uh, Schwarzman, for example. And a lot of these students at one point uh, are interested in setting up their own company. And Tsinghua actually uh, picks these students 
up very early and you can sit in their incubator for free, you get mentorship and so on and so on. So they have a very good program and most of the um, okay startups and good startups that I see here in Beijing that have a foreign founder are usually coming from uh, Qinghai Extra, um, just as a, as a side information. Um, one thing that's very unique about them, it's, um, it's a very Chinese network. So they are usually 99% local Chinese. Um, as a foreign startup, it's super hard to get in there. Uh, getting mentorship, it's difficult. Um, getting like support that you would get in a Berlin or so on. Sorry that I always mention Berlin. I'm from Germany, by the way, um, is also different. So there comes in again, um, international community organizations because they can help you to navigate a bit. Um, they all have massive pool of resources, um, really good mentorship network and also a good corporate network, but not as good just as a, as a comparison. Um, in a way, one of the strong points is having a lot of corporates. Um, but the thing with corporates here in China is they're focusing usually on local Chinese startups because they are looking for on the Chinese market developing an, a mindset of accepting international startups to their local corporate innovation programs is still very rare. Okay, next one. Yeah, um, actually this, this one um, is just a, a, a bit more content. You can read that later on in the slides. Um, Tusta is all over China. So they're also in second, third tier cities. Um, they have uh, they have incubated and invested in tons of startups, and uh, this is actually what the slide shows. I mean, I, I covered a bit of ground already before. I don't want to dive too much into this time. Oh, I need to hurry up, right? Okay, let me just do that a bit quicker. Um, OTAC is one of the government entities, uh, Overseas Talent Entrepreneurship Conference. So this is one of the agencies that is doing annually uh, a competition for startups to join. You get resources there, matchmaking, can promote, can win, win prizes. Uh, that's more for the Chaoyang side, uh, not for the Haidian side. Um, this is an international platform. They also have international website, but uh, they also have a bit the problem of not having uh, too much of a team that can actually interact well with, uh, with um, international startups. But um, the competition is one of the best and a lot of embassies work with them together. If you want more information, please let me know. Um, linked with the Chaoyang government, just that you know, there is a, a bit of a struggle between Chaoyang and Haidian. Chaoyang is the international one, wants to be more techy. Haidian is the techy one and wants to be more international. So they are kind of like competing against each other. It's quite an interesting uh, thing to see as a foreigner. Um, but yeah, um, just that you know, all tech related to Chaoyang. Next one. Zhong Wan Sun, in a way, uh, from the name, you already see it's uh, linked to Zhong Wan Sun. A lot of people always think Zhong Wan Sun is only Haidian, but it's not. But this, in this case, uh, in a way, is based in, in Haidian, uh, and it has very close ties to uh, the Zhong Wan Sun um, government and the Haidian government. Um, as a mother company, in a way, has a real estate company, which is very preferential in terms of uh, space. Um, so um, the Haidian Property Group is the largest real estate company in Haidian. So if you are looking for larger offices or anything like this, they usually have the space for stuff. Um, here, some numbers. So they have until now accumulated 3000 startups. And please remember what I said before about transparency. Um, 40 accelerators and incubators. Um, uh, some of them are international and some of them are not. Um, and they, the interesting thing about Innoway is they cover the complete value chain of an ecosystem, excluding community and university but they have good network. So that's why Startup Grind is like so, so much involved. So Ka, Sabrina and I, we are all like involved in Startup Grind. So we're trying to build synergies here. Next one. Somebody should have told me I'm too slow. Um, all right, plug and play. Uh, probably all of you have heard of plug and play before. They also have a branch here in, in uh, China. It's more a franchise system. So it's, it's a bit, uh, they're doing their own thing here. Um, but they're also a seed investor and they're accelerating startups. They have a super strong network to corporates. Um, so if you're a B2B startup coming from abroad and you want to uh, enter some deals with clients here, um, they're definitely someone you should check out. And um, uh, plug and play is not only here in Beijing, they're all over China, so in eight cities. And they have um, yeah, invested in over 200 startups and they have a very good ties to the, to the local governments. 
Uh, so if there is any player in the market who has not ties to the government, don't talk to them. That's, that's a given. Next one. OK, um, so one of the goals that I want to, or um, one of the things that I wanted to have all of you as a takeaway is, how do you actually navigate in the market? And um, because very often, if you're trying to go to Tokyo and you don't know anybody, you will not meet anyone. And you will not be shown around. And one thing that we want to do is make sure that you will find someone to get shown around. So all of the people that I will show here are responsive are involved in at least one or two organizations and they're all amazing. So I promise you, if you write to any of them on LinkedIn, you will get a reply. And if you don't, please let me know. And please write in the LinkedIn, like, hey, uh, greetings from Yalta, I just heard from you, you're an amazing person, can we connect? And if they don't reply, let me know, then I kick them out of the slides, but I, I don't think so. So let's start from the left. Tico um, is a co-director of Startup Grand Beijing. She's amazing, she's from Georgia, super active, likes to dance, so if you're more on fun, um, meet with her here, she's really cool. Um, I didn't put Sabrina in here now because she already has all the attention. Um, then Nina Rong, she's part of Ladies Who Tech, also works for Toasty, which is a really amazing platform for uh, virtual networking and so on and so on. And Ladies Who Tech is a platform that focuses on female entrepreneurship, uh, STEM, and um, it's a really cool platform. Uh, talk to her, great community below. Um, Petros, he's just amazing. Um, he's the founder of Beehive. Uh, co-founder. Uh, he's also part of Startup Grand Beijing. Um, he is everywhere and he helps in terms of personal development. Also comes into place if you are a foreign founder, even if you're A-round, B-round, whatever, and you want to come here. They do sessions about how to navigate um, Chinese business um, uh, culture, things like this. So that can be helpful. If you want to go a bit more techy, there's uh, Vue Beijing. Um, that's a Coda uh, community with JT. Um, also part of the Akadu startup, uh, which is based here on the street, really cool guy. Um, then the next one is Andre Chueme. He's from Brazil. Um, he's the curator of Startup Digest and also the lead for Startup uh, Weekend. Also a really cool guy, part of Startup Brand Beijing. So I write to him, he works for Ericsson One, so also, also the, the corporate um, side. The next one is Katja Kleindienst. Um, she's also co-directed Startup Brand Beijing, but also started on the side, um, the German innovators in Beijing. Uh, in China, which is a platform for German and Chinese um, exchange of, of innovators. Um, and then the last one, uh, Simon, he is um, probably one of the dinosaurs here in this, uh, in this line. I hope he's not offended by this, but uh, I have, I've heard of him uh, before I even heard of uh, Startup Point. Um, so he's around forever. He knows all the startups, all the corporates, everything that's happening. Really cool guy, really good connected. I reach out to him. Next slide. <clears throat> Damn, it's like really quick. Okay, coming now to, to mentors. Uh, everybody claims to be a mentor, but uh, I believe what comes into this is you need to know your stuff and you need to be approachable. So these people, um, so one or two of them might be difficult to get because they're super, super busy. But if you want to, to get their attention, let me know. Um, but I think also all of them, if you reach out to them on LinkedIn, they will reply. Uh, Ria is a good friend of mine. Uh, she's the co-founder of She Loves Tech. Uh, yeah, She Loves Tech. Sometimes I got mixed up with ladies uh, who tag and she, she loves tech. Um, she is uh, really well connected in um, Southeast Asia as well. Uh, so she knows her stuff and can help you around. Um, Alexa, Heidi and Pioneer Park, also a very good place in, uh, in Heidi and District. And uh, they're doing a lot of uh, things also for international founders, really responsive, um, also on LinkedIn. Uh, Rich Robinson, um, he does tons of stuff. He's also a professor for entrepreneurship on Guanghua School of Management. Um, he's a mentor at Hacks, the Hardware Accelerator and China Accelerator. And um, he has had his uh, two own startups and so on and so on, really cool guy. And um, coming to Yodo and James Lalonde, he has his own pitch club, which is uh, like similar, like fight club. You have to pitch if you join this, which is a really cool initiative. This, his own startup is successful in the gaming industry. Um, also a really cool guy. And he will give you tons of feedback. He's super responsive. Uh, Chen from Plug and Play. Um, he always has time for a beer. So if you're an international founder, just 
drop him a line, say like, hey, I'm coming here. You'll definitely go out and, and uh, join for a beer. So good mentors, please remember them. Um, yeah, next one. <clears throat> so where would we be without startups? Um, the triangle is important, right? So we have incubators, accelerators, governments, and we have um, communities. But again, you want to vet. And you can vet by knowing startups. And here are four of the startups um, and entrepreneurs. They also have a couple of cool co-founders, but they're responsive. They know their stuff. They have grown here and um, they can show you around. So they tell you the truth from the false information you get here in the market. Uh, first one is Alvaro, a good friend. I met him before he actually started. Uh, he was a mess at Microsoft, but uh, turned out to be a really success in his uh, founding journey. Um, Akadu is a really cool uh, thing also for live translation. Um, you should check that out. Uh, Lisa or Lise um, Farben at Thrive Beijing. She also writes a lot of content for the Beijing uh, ecosystem. So she's also an amazing person. Uh, Sebastian Kobach, he's probably one of the most critical person here in this um, panel. Um, so he can tell you tons of bad stuff about players in the Beijing market, which is a good thing. Um, he will not say that publicly, or maybe he will, but uh, meet him for a beer. He also likes beer um, and he will help you out. And um, Evoke is like an e-motorcycle uh, startup. So they're in the, in the tech and mobility sector. Really cool startup. Um, Miata, uh, Kent and Silk, and also Lady Sutak. She's also a really brilliant community builder and has her own startup. She's very much involved in the African entrepreneurship community. <coughs> so you should also uh, know her. Um, cool person. So now startups, we have covered the triangle, we have covered the startups, so next slide please. So here are a couple of things, and that's the last slide, um, that I hope you will never do. There are of course some things that I haven't mentioned here. If you do them, then you're like stupid and it's not worth writing them down. So I will not mention them here. So first one is play the international game. Um, Everybody comes here and says like, hey, I know how startup and entrepreneurship goes. I will do my thing here and um, I will set up like stuff and do business as, as usual. Um, uh, you can ask my colleague, Wu Yang. I'm doing that from time to time. And they're all like just blanking out and say like, oh, yeah, that's Yalta again, doing this international stuff. It doesn't work, never. Uh, so don't try to do your international thing. You should adapt and you can adapt by um, either localizing yourself or getting people involved who can help you to localize. Very easy, what you can do is getting an intern on board very, very soon, Chinese one, just adapt a bit to the language, to the culture, to how they, I don't know, uh, do things. You can also do that by not being in China. So if you're sitting in Silicon Valley, just go to the next top university. There are tons of Chinese, maybe not now, but usually, and you can find an intern and then um, just figure out how they talk, uh, what they think about the startup, and it will help you a lot to prepare. Um, going without doing your homework, um, that is also in the direction of IP protection. Um, do your homework. China is not uh, a mean market, um, not meaner than any other market. But if you go to any foreign market and you don't do your homework in terms of IP protection, they will spit you out dead. And that is not a Chinese thing, that's anywhere. Uh, so please don't be stupid, do your homework. Um, that's also about like which cities are there. Don't go to like a third tier, fourth tier city that you've never heard of. And just because somebody says, here's 5 million B, come to my space. Um, don't, don't do that. So always cross validate information. Um, yeah, that comes to the next point, uh, vetting your partners. Um, talk to community organizations, always. Reach out to the ones that seem to be active. If you don't know who's active, write to me. I can show you in any city who's active. And if you are working with one of these government entities and you're not sure if this is a legit player, write to me, I connect you to the person and they will cross validate this. Um, also ask them for recommendations. So just not, re um, what's the word for that? Um, I don't know. Uh, anyway, so for uh, startups that can actually vouch for them, just ask for that. Uh, if they don't come up with that, just ignore them. Um, Super important thing is saying no to China. I don't think that's actually a thing for anyone anymore, uh, unless you're like only targeting uh, Swiss mountain, mm, I don't know, farmers, uh, then you should not, eh, maybe we should still go to China. I think China is crucial. And I think everybody, uh, any startup that's in the B2B or B2C realm should learn uh, what China is like. 
And it's actually not too expensive to try it out. So if you're doing already your first uh, revenue and you uh, have, let's say, 10, 20,000 uh, euros on the side, you, have, you can do a trial strategy for China. Very simple. And uh, just do it. Um, and the last thing, not having WeChat. I am always invited to these delegations of foreign startups coming to China. And then I'm in the networking session and then I'm sitting there with Chen, who's plug and play seed investor. And he's asking me, hey, let's exchange WeChat. And we're like, no, I, it's like data privacy. I don't want to give my data away. Mm. If you do that, don't come here. Mm. Yeah, so please install WeChat. That's super crucial. Uh, it, because otherwise it's like, I don't know, going to the swimming pool in a, in a business suit. Doesn't make sense. So um, if you come to China, do it right and get your WeChat. That's it. Um, now we can go to Q&A and I hope there will be some fun questions in there. Um, okay. Yeah, Yalta, thanks a lot. Uh, Yalta and Sabrina for tons of uh, great insights. So yeah, we're a bit over time, so let's uh, not lose more, even more time and jump right into it. Um, let me uh, read you uh, the first question that I chose. Um, one of the attendees is asking, what are some of the specific supports from local governments? If I decide to go to Beijing to start my business, what can I expect in terms of real support? Can I get funding or help with workspace? Yeah. Um, here's the thing also coming back to transparency, every government institution and sorry, we for saying that, but I uh, would say, Hey, yes, we have these big things. Welcome. And then you figure out, Oh yeah. Um, so you first have to register your entity. You have to be in business for two years. You have to have five employees and blah, blah, blah. Some of these things are actually legit. So in terms of, so if you have a PhD and you have, a, um, an IP or something in something cool. Uh, then the Chinese government will give you like incentives to come here to get a visa. But uh, just throwing out money is very seldom. Uh, so there are some competitions which do that. Uh, OTEC, for example, they have these things, but that's also linked towards you have to settle down with your startup. Um, but that's not, nothing really bad. Um, in terms of like uh, setting up, uh, honestly, mm, space in China is comparatively cheap if you're small and all the players have incentives to get you in for free for for like a super low rate and if you have questions there um talk to me talk to the community organizations um one thing again do your homework and always talk to at least two or three um because one thing is the first person will tell you oh yeah it's like ten thousand RMB a month next one five thousand and maybe you stop because you say it's fifty percent and then you talk to the third one <clears throat> not dropping any names, but Heidi and Pioneer Park, uh, they will give you a space for two years for free. And I believe in like real competition and the market should be transparent and startups should know that. And that's what startup communities are for, that they can actually help entrepreneurs to find the best thing for them. But if it's for free, it comes usually with a downside. So then you're very far in the north of Heidi, um, which can be good, can be bad. Mm, but yeah, again, do your homework. Great. Uh, next one is, um, what are the biggest pain points for foreign startups in Beijing? <clears throat> so I would differentiate now coming back to the, to the little ugly dog or whatever it is with a, a startup life cycle. It depends on who you are. So if you're soon to be founder, you will start with different things than an early stage founder or like, like a growth um, uh, startup. So I never give like an average answer on that because I need to know who you actually are. So let's assume you're, a foreign founder here in Beijing, I would say, oh, actually it's, it's the same for like a foreign founder who starts here in Beijing or a foreign founder who wants to come to Beijing. It's like they never know where to start. It's like so much stuff and everybody wants to lure them in. Or it's like, um, so people think like Beijing is one of the major tech hubs, startup hubs that just go somewhere and then you will find this vibrant place of everybody being around. It's super hard to find, like really hard. Getting good information takes you a while. If you're not in WeChat, if you're not invited into any of the groups, you will not get good information. So I think one of the biggest pain points is um, not knowing where to start, not knowing who to trust. So building this uh, minimum uh, validation points or a triangle is very hard because if you're working with one of the governments, so you're coming to Inouye or something, they are very protective about their own position. They do not want to share. 
Chinese are not about sharing you, you with anybody else. It's, that's the community sense of it. Uh, and we want to help, we want to show you around. So we tell you, there is a plug and play, there is a Hyde Empire in your park, there is a Jung Wenzun in a way, blah, 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 blah. So you will get laid out all of that. So that will help you out. Um, then uh, probably with the ones that uh, come here and seriously want business, the biggest hurdle will come at one point with investment. Um, because most of the um, investment firms here in the Chinese market, they, do, they have no real experience investing into um, international startups. So um, they do not trust that you can make it. So um, one of the things is they always ask you, oh, are you married to a Chinese? Um, are, you, do you, are you serious about it? Are you staying five years? They, they ask like, what visa do you have? So uh, do you speak Chinese? So if you, even if you're like HSK six and you're married to a Chinese and you have kids here, they would still think like, mm, maybe we'll go back in a year. So they will not trust you. So that's one of the biggest pain points. But um, there are a lot of success cases of foreign founders getting investment. Many of them are actually in, in Shanghai, but some cases also here in Beijing. Some of them are in our own space in the lab. Great, a uh, question from Nick Torres. Can you share a story about a foreign entrepreneur that successfully started a company? And also quite similar question, maybe you can add, what are some of the best known and successful foreign startups in Beijing? That's a tough one. And that's um, because also for me, so we have a WeChat group of currently around 200 uh, foreign founders. Um, in Beijing, it's still hard to find the really successful ones. So having B round, so startups that start here and become really successful, um, I wouldn't say there are any. So most of them, they, they are now getting uh, close to a seed pre A. Um, and again, bringing an example of uh, uh, Alvaro and Akadu, uh, we have seen them emerging from a one man show to now a team of 10. Uh, they got investment um, also linked to uh, Tsinghua X Lab. And um, they're developing quite well, but they are now struggling with product, product market fit um, because what they have developed is not, um, doesn't have a market yet and they are still iterating. Um, also Evo that I showed there, um, they, they are now focusing more outside clients and not the Chinese market. So they're using here the sourcing strategy and so on and so on. So it's still, to be honest, a super tough market. And the, um, now the, the foreign entrepreneurs are just starting to develop. In the Shanghai market, it's a bit different. So we have more successful cases, but that's something we would cover in uh, next month's webinar. Okay, we will leave um, time for two more questions. So how hard is it to receive government financial support as a foreign startup? And what is the main disadvantage of this uh, cooperation? <clears throat> Again, you have to stay, you have to register. And if you're not a tech startup, forget about it. Um, so you should be tech-based, big data, AI, having robots, something like this. If you don't have anything like that, you will not get anything. So it's very, very hard. Um, I would say if you really mean it and you want to come to China and you are one of these B2B technology startups, it's quite simple. But um, from a hundred startups that say, I want to come to China, I think only one is serious. And this one startup um, then depends on if they need government support or not. The downside sometimes of government support might be, uh, so if, you, if you're looking for investment at one point and the government entities, well, please, they're they are offering to invest in you. And if you want to grow further internationally, that in, international investors will say no. Um, that you must be very careful about if you're going to second or third year cities. But usually in the Beijing market, um, they will not invest in you. They give you a grant, um, but you have to fulfill a lot of criteria, and, um, and uh, then, then you get the money, but only if you set up the company. And the funny thing is, these policies are super intransparent. Even the people working on this do not know what that actually means. So it's more like a trial and error. But there are consultancies working with people like you. So if, if you want to, uh, so it's usually, I think, 10% or something uh, success case. So you work with a consultancy, they help you to uh, get these grants, and then they get 10% of the investment or the, the grant back. Uh, this is something if you don't want to bother. 
Great, and now we'll move to the last <laughs> question for today. Um, are there advantages for setting up in a different locals, such as Beijing, Shanghai, or Shenzhen, for example? Um, I personally believe that all three of them are actually the same. Um, some of them, so all of them have good talent. All of them have a massive market. All of them have their, like, it doesn't matter. So if you're an IoT startup, you can do it in Shanghai, Shenzhen, or Beijing. Um, there are some rumors of saying like, hey, hardware, you can only go to Shenzhen. Of course, some things are better, but you get everything also in Beijing. Each of these ecosystems are like a little country. Um, so Beijing, 20 million, that's like half of Europe. Just kidding, but it's like, it's still massive. Um, you get everything here, everything that you need. Um, and I believe it comes more back to um, where do you like it best? So do you like a lot of uh, international vibe, international restaurants, going out and sitting on a rooftop, go to Shanghai. If you want to have like a super modern city, really tacky, uh, centered to APAC or like very close to center of APAC, go to Shenzhen. If you want to do really hardcore business and you want to sell the out of it, uh, be in Beijing because people here are super easy to approach. Um, you can very easily uh, close a deal within a month for a couple of millions. Um, and I think the business environment in Beijing is very nice. Um, yeah, so it comes back to uh, you spending a month in China and going to all the three cities and choosing which one you like the best. Um, and I don't see much of a difference between these three cities. Uh, great. Thank you, Yota, so much and Sabrina for, for answers and uh, clearing out the the questions for of our audience. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to answer them all. Otherwise, we'll have to stay one more hour. But um, as you know, communication doesn't stop here. We have a WeChat group where you can uh, super welcome to text there, uh, write your questions there, or reach out directly to Yelta or Sabrina, and they will be super happy to answer. And uh, if you're interested, uh, if you have more interest in the uh, ecosystem of China, this is just the first event in a series of events regarding the uh, startup ecosystem of China. In one month, we'll also have events uh, about another city, most probably Shanghai. So stay tuned. We also will cover Shenzhen later on. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot for, uh, for tuning in, for listening to us, and hope you guys enjoyed. So see you next time. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.